the Kentucky number. Nice. Hello. Hey, Daisy. This is Sean. Hey, how are you? Hey, hey. <laughs> yeah, I said I would call around four, and then everything's been getting pushed back. This is my third interview of the day. Oh, right on. Yeah. So thank you for Sorry, doing I'm it. Not gonna lie. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. I <laughs> I wouldn't expect you to remember. I mean, not like you, but like the people I'm going to call. Cause, uh, I mean, I put a note in my phone about it. I'm just like, I'm in this like crazy place of a, I'm finalizing a bunch of long shirts to get printed so we can go on tour. Oh, sick. Sick. Yeah. Um, so, well, how are you? Good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I just watched your new, uh, new ish, uh, single video, right? It's a single. Yes, one of them is. One of them. Okay. of them. Okay, cool. So, yeah, just for context, uh, we're talking to Daisy Kaplan from the band Lung. And you, your role in that band is Meg White, right? That's how you would describe it? Yes, I'm Meg White and Lung. I, I play the role of Meg White. I play the role of Meg White. Yeah, since Meg, Meg White has somewhat retired from her role as Meg White. You I mean, would, you're in Michigan, you know. Isn't she around? Isn't she? Yeah. We're from the same state, so I know her. That's uh, <laughs> basically, uh, isn't that your, literally your claim to fame is that Facebook post, right? That's, yeah, that's it. That's my whole life, basically. Uh, There's a Facebook post that I made about Meg White being a good drummer and then it getting super out of control. Yeah. Yeah. I heard a little about that. Didn't she say uh, she's tired of hearing uh, about Daisy Kaplan being a bad drummer or whatever? She did, and then she made stickers and sent a bunch to me. It was really weird. Yeah. <laughs> Not sure what that's all about. She do you didn't... ever think that her... Do you think her and Darcy from Smashing Pumpkins hang out? I don't know. Why, why do you ask? I don't know, because they're both in Michigan and, like, sort of, like, Solinger-esque, sort of, like... Oh, retired yeah. Retired from music, but not really retired from music. Right. Or, whatever, or, like, disappeared from music, I guess, is a better way to put that. I just... I would imagine... I don't know. That's A, that is a rhythm section I'd like to hear, and B, like... Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Seems like they'd be friends. You're you're right. You're right on all fronts there. That's a good question. Maybe they have a secret band. They probably have a secret band. They probably hang out all the time, but no one's going to know about it. I mean, there's only, what, like seven or eight people in the whole state of Michigan, so you got to <laughs> hang out with who, who, who you have, right? I know. I know. I just talked to two of the people in Michigan, and I have another one in the room here. Uh, my friend Tanner is recording everything. He, he's he been doing this... Uh, my favorite strings theory, uh, series with me. Hi, Tanner. How are you? I'm great. How are you, Daisy? I'm pretty good. Yeah. I'm tired of like the four people who live in Ohio. It's really annoying. <laughs> You're tired of them? Yeah, I'm sick of them. <laughs> well, good. Yeah. Th- there was a time when uh, you-, you would come to Michigan and play in Lansing or something, and twice I got to play with you. That was cool. That is true. It was awesome. Yeah. Was the that second time there was that was the last Foxy Shazam show? Yeah, that was it. That was that was the. It was not scheduled to be the last show, but it ended up being the last show. Yeah, interesting. Um, and uh, I think it was it was at that show I was playing a, a Squire Bass Six or a Squire Six, and you're like, "Is that that's for real, a Squire?" Because you were impressed by it. I mean, I've heard those before. I was particularly impressed by you are really good at playing. You could do like little <laughs> bits that were like not really guitar bits because that's kind of like selling it short, but like this sort of middle ground bass six like kind of lines. And then you could sort of, I don't know if you were doing, I can't remember. You told me a long time ago. I, there was like a different setting you would go to with a pedal, I think, where it like really worked well as a bass and then it could sort of work well as like a like in between sort of baritone instrument and i thought it was really cool yeah oh thank you yeah yeah i uh it's an interesting instrument and i right right it it fills all those positions i think you know it can it's it's a really weird one because it's like i couldn't i couldn't quite ever get it to where like i kind of got it to like that kind of like pure point where it's sort of like I could do like little in-between things do little chording things I was really dissatisfied with the way it chorded overall that okay. was kind of my only real complaint about it and like sure yeah yeah but like like little lines it's perfect and then like I don't really prefer it for my playing for like doing like bass bass stuff 
True. Like, yeah. You know, be like you do a good job with it, Max from a spacer. Yeah. And if, and if he does a really because t- we have an ongoing argument, me and him, <laughs> where he's like, it's the base. I'm like, it's not base, it's different things. Base six. And he's like, no, it's base. And I'm like, no, it's a base six. It's a different instrument. But the way he actually, he actually does. He is very skilled at making it like using its quirks to its advantage to do base stuff. Yeah. Whereas, yeah. like, for whatever reason, that always kind of, like, never worked for me. It was just, like, I was, like, sort of, like, a weird hybrid for me in between a baritone guitar and a bass that was, like, like, for some reason, like, for my playing and my writing was kind of odd. So that's why I eventually got rid of it. But it's so cool. I mean, I like it, obviously. But Yeah, yeah. So you, um, I know you played guitar and bass in Foxy Shazam. Um, it's a complicated question, but essentially, yes. Yeah, right, right. Um, like basically, I'm basically I'm a bass player. Okay. Every band I've been in, I've been in the position of like at least some of the time writing the guitar parts to go with whatever's happening. Okay. And so I sort of like know how to play guitar, to show guitar players how to play stuff I wrote, basically. So I'm not like <laughs> really a guitarist. Like I'm kind of like bass is what I do, but I can sort of like do sort of like a minimal kind of guitar thing that like you know, fills in when needed just to sort of like write parts and stuff. And like mm-hmm. bass is definitely more my primary thing in the past. Like since I saw you at that show, I got a baritone guitar from some like weird, like sketchy dude in Cleveland and like got into that. And that's kind of where I got into bass six too. And I was like, okay, cool. This is like, this may, those make a little more sense to me as a bass player uh-huh. is like a lot of chording instruments, I guess. So that makes sense. Yeah. So. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, yeah, we're we're gonna talk to Max later, hopefully. If he picks up. If he picks up, yeah. I'm just kidding. He's he always picks up. Max is the best. Oh, good, good. I'm I'm glad you recommended him to us. You know, like I haven't met him at all, but like I uh, just messaged him like about it, and then the next day it was his birthday, so that was really funny. And I just referenced. He's a really good dude. He's been around in Cincinnati for a while. Okay. I've known him. I've known him for probably probably eight or nine years at this point. He's just a good player and a good dude. Great guy. Yeah, I think I spotted him in one of the lung videos that I was watching again this week. That's right. He ended up in the butcher video. Yeah. Along with a big pile of other people. Yeah, that was cool. Um, so I mean, yeah, I'm. What's going to end up in this video is is talking about the base six, but. Uh, I don't know. So, if you had anything more to say about that, oh yeah, I mean, ask me any questions about it. I have, I have a bunch of opinions. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you found it like weird to chord, do chordal stuff, and would you say you prefer then to do do some of that different stuff on like a baritone guitar? Yeah. To me, it sounds weird when you get below like the range of a baritone for chording. Like, yeah. I felt like yeah. The kind of chords I ended up doing were like where I would hold a bass note with my thumb and then do the rest of the chord an octave higher, which was pretty cool. Yeah. And I, like I can get into that okay, but like, you know what I'm saying? Where there's like this weird point. I feel like it's right on a B or an A where it starts getting like any chording gets a little muddy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like, hear that. Yeah. It kind of hit that point for me and like, which I could get around okay. It just like was not as conducive to like what I was trying to play with it. Um, yeah, I felt like I had a hard time sw- like with finding an amp setup that could do like the you whatever you had was really good with it where it like could go low but then the highs weren't muddy or it would be too tinny like it was really weird. Right, I for me getting it amplified correctly and it was a it was a Squire Base Six, mm-hmm. like a pretty exact same one you had. Yeah, the white. Max, you have mine. I think he <laughs> might have bought his from Dave Nicholson, who I sold mine to. <laughs> Okay, I'll ask him. Like, th- yeah, that, that may be wrong, though. Don't okay. Me, but, um, yeah, it was more like an amplification thing. I actually liked playing it. I thought the action was good. Uh-huh. I believe it might have been altered a little bit with some weird different bridge. Oh, it, I can't pr- remember exactly. Probably. Now, but it was like, it's like lines were cool, like kind of like post-punky like kind of stuff was really cool, but like big chords, even when I was like muting out a bunch of strings, like never sounded big if that makes sense like they sounded kind of like squashy and weird yeah right i would see where if if you're used to 
you know, playing bass or playing even chords on bass, it, you know, or it's not as low as a bass, frankly. It it technically is, but the strings have to be somewhat lighter. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it doesn't have the same. The, something in the timbre is like a little different in a way that like for some stuff was cool, and for some stuff I was like, I don't know about that. Like I've always been a kind of chording heavy bass player, uh-huh. but I guess part of the difference is like you don't have as many. Like you can't do like a six string chord on a bass. Like you're gonna do like a maximum of like two or three strings, you know? Right. Right. So with the bass six, it was like I couldn't really do like full guitar chord the way you can on a baritone or something. Like it was kind of it has its own little rhythm and its own little language in a way that. And I'm not shit talking at all. Like I actually think that's cool. It just like I think I had it for like a year and a half, two years, and recorded a bunch of stuff, and then like got rid of it to buy an amp or something like that. I can't remember why because it was just kind of sitting around. Yeah, but it's still cool. It's a very. I just I think the main thing and this goes back to me and Max's argument is I do think you kind of have to approach it as a completely separate instrument from a bass, a guitar, or a baritone. Yeah, it really is. Uh, that's the way I feel about it. It's, it's like really inspirational if you just come at it you know in a fresh way uh and i would say i'm more of a guitar player but you know i've played bass in bands so getting this to me was like a a really nice in between and right i feel like you're a guitar player who knows what a bass does though and that's kind of like (laughs) some guitar players will either like who who switch back and forth the guitar bass will either super overplay or super underplay uh-huh. And I think you have a pretty good idea of like how a bass should sound, and then like at least in that show, which is like forever ago, but like I remember being <laughs> impressed by how you would sort of switch between the different parts very quickly and very efficiently, and it worked with the songs. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I was I was playing through like a big bass amp too, so maybe that worked with a lot of speakers. Did you have uh, ten inch speakers? That might have been it. Might have been it. That's I was playing my dad's PV setup, so I'm not sure exactly. Probably had a couple ten inches and, and also like a giant speaker on the bottom. I can't remember. That might be my mistake because I everything I have is like fifteen inch speakers or bigger because I'm like that. But <laughs> I actually really like ten inch speakers for like in tandem with like it has to be you know there's a bunch of other factors obviously but like I like them in tandem with bigger speakers mm-hmm. like described. I think I always think that sounds good and cool. Yeah. Um, so right, you you must have had the, like the white one with the red pit guard, too, or no? Mine was like a like whatever you call it, like sunburst or whatever, and I think it had like a weird black pit guard or something like that. Okay. Well, that's, yeah, I'm sure that's the same same model, just different color. Right. Exactly. Um, uh, did you mess around a lot with the the switching on there? You know, it's like a a Fender Jaguar basically. But I did, and it was like I really didn't like it. Yeah, and that's probably one of my main things with that. Where it's like it took forever to get something that was like good, like because it was there was like I felt like there was one sound that really worked, and like it would take like a million switches just to get to like I don't know. I kind of like I almost want to try one with like a simpler pickup setup. And I mean, the few times I've tried, like it's a it's a Jaguar setup, right? Yeah, I, I would say so without the rhythm circuit, but yeah. I mean, I'm just a hater on Jaguars. Like, I just, I just don't think they sound that good. I never <laughs> played one where I'm like, this sounds awesome. Like, I'm very, like, meat and potatoes guitar and bass-wise. Like, I want less options in general. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I I think my favorite electric guitar at the moment is the Jazzmaster, and that's, you know, similar. But that's cool. a little less stuff going on, though, right? Like, yeah, that's a little simpler, I would say, than the the Jaguar. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I kind of agree with the meat and potato stuff. Cause like I, I, uh, it was at, uh, elderly instruments in Lansing that I got this space six from. And, uh, I just like tried to plug it in and it, you know, no sound came out. So I'm like, what's wrong with it? But you know, all the switches were going, <laughs> yeah, all those, the four switches were going the same way. So it's like, Oh, right. That's why. So there's there's still like a learning curve if you're used to like playing a strat or something. But yeah, it's just a little bit more going on in a way, but like not in a way where like it does something radically different. At least in terms of like my playing, it was just sort of like okay, there's a lot more options and I don't know what to do with them. I mean, I'll, this also might just be like I'm just not that good, but <laughs> it, it's just, it's just kind of a thing where it's like all right, cool, here's a bunch of stuff that doesn't doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. And that is kind of a barrier. And, you know, I, I'm just like coming around to it, you know, because I have a couple jazz masters in this and I'm like, OK, I, I get it now. I get it now. It's kind of just like pick up on and off. And then there's a strangle switch, they call it. It's the fourth one, I th- right. which I think is like a bass cut. Bass frequency cut or something. Scoops a little of that out. I guess. Uh, See, if I would have figured this out, then I would have been in a that would have been a better situation. <laughs> well, you know, I'm sure they came with like manuals back in the '60s. I mean, if if this was the '60s, I'd be set. But I'm. <laughs> that's it's whatever year it is now, so I'm screwed. I know that's like our generation right there. You said it. Put it on a T-shirt. There's no, there's no manuals. Everybody lost the manuals. <laughs> We, need, we needed them so badly. I don't know where they went, but we'll have to find them one day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have any other uh, thoughts on that model? or I, I mean, there's like other, uh, there's other like six string bass, bass six EDE basses that are out there. Have you played any of those? No, I only played that one, and that was for like, maybe had it for a year or two. What's uh-huh. the deal with the other ones? I don't tell me about them. Well, it was... Out. Yeah, the, uh, um, maybe you could find like a Dan Electro one, which I think is like simpler. It's just like E to E, probably like volume tone. Hmm. Um, that that's who originated it back in the mid '50s was the Dan Electro brand, and then Gibson made some fancy ones back then too. And are they good or are they like how Gibsons are? <laughs> how Gibsons are? <laughs> that's that's funny because the. Um, the video I'm shooting today probably is going to be the, the one about the Gibson Les Paul, which uh, there's going to be a lot of feelings about that too. What but are your feelings about it? I I like I really like it, but I just I don't know if it could ever be my main guitar. But I have a lot of Gibson acoustics that I love a lot, so that's you know, like the Les Paul is like super coveted and everything, and I I think there's like a couple generations of people who have kind of like, cause I talked to like boomers about it and they're like, hell yeah, great guitar, you know? And I'm like, pre- I'm pretty much, I feel that way, but I think people want to like eschew it or something as being like a, like a status symbol maybe. I mean, you mean the, the people who have come of age in the time period where you, they're just unaffordable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my thing is like, one thing if it's like a guitar that like is super it's like it costs a bunch of money and it's like really good but it's like like they don't stay in tune like it's like one out of 50 is like actually good like gibsons are just so variable like and yeah. especially when you add in like through the years so it's like like a really like super nice les balls yeah it's worth money and it's good but it's like most of them aren't and they've been kind of riding that name a really long time yeah i i think they've always been variable I, even the ones that are like you know $300,000 like 1958 Sunburst Les Paul that you know just like Joe Bonamassa is going to end up owning it you know because that's <laughs> inevitable some, it's inevitable law, your nonsense. what's that I said yeah just some blues law your nonsense like it's not not really like it's a museum piece it's not really like an instrument to be played right right um, I mean it's, it's like I don't know I feel like that's most of Man, this, this interview is going to get me in trouble. I'm going to get yelled at. <laughs> um, I feel like that's most of the history of Gibson, just to be real. Like, I feel like it's like, yeah. like they have some good stuff. I like SGs. I like less balls when they're like good, but it's like mm. a lot of them aren't. And it's like, well, okay. Yeah. I don't like any of their bases at all. Like that. Sometimes people yell at me about that. I think they all sound kind of. I don't know. Like, oh, yeah. Not super good. I guess it's also variable. Like, I've had an SG bass I liked at one point. Mm-hmm. But, like, I play, every other one I played just sounded like, like, I don't know, like rolling a can of paint down a staircase. <laughs> it's people like, dunk, dunk, dunk. <laughs> people love, what is it, grabbers? But I don't, I don't know. They always, they look cool, but they sound stupid. Yeah, the grabber and the ripper and the, yeah. Um, what do you feel about the Thunderbird? Um, They always sound bad. Get her baseline in a bad way. <laughs> um, the one really cool bass Gibson did that I totally forgot about this. 
because in true Gibson fashion, it's split into three different pieces on tour, is the victory <laughs> base. Oh, oh, yeah. Cool. Those sound awesome. But... Yeah, I feel like... Um... I feel like the guy from Husker Du used to play one of those. He indeed did. Okay. Uh, okay. My friend Chris Owens, who used to be in the band Lords, mm-hmm. he had one, I think he let me record with it, and then my other friend sold me one because it sounded so good. They just have a cool sound. like. And uh, true to form, like the one he had was like in super nice shape, and the one I bought was like had a weird bent neck and sucked. But like, <laughs> it sounded awesome. Yeah, so that's my that that might be my number one Gibson. That's not acoustic. They make some great acoustics. Oh yeah, undoubtedly. Yeah, I've got some weird. Uh, yeah, I made three videos about Gibson acoustics. So that's that's it's telling. It's not really my world as much, but like, there's not many I've heard where I'm like that sucks. Like, it always sounds good. It always plays good. Like, yeah. But yeah, I I kind of hear you there. It's like if you're gonna go around and play a bunch, just probably grab some kind of like Fender thing. Frankly. Yeah, get a jazz bass if you're gonna if you're gonna play a player. Uh, everything with Gibson is like it's also like worth too much money. It's like you can't really tour with that. It's like you can always buy a new jazz bass, you know. Yeah. For money, like you know. Yeah, that's that's a good point. This is see this turned out to be like a really a really good interview for like every every aspect of this series. That I'm doing. Well, it's like people who tour like I know people who tour with like guitars that are worth like not five figures. That's a really bad idea. Like, people steal stuff. Yeah. If you're playing, like, unless you're playing, like, huge places, like, there's just not a point to, like, travel with, like, a, you know, five-figure guitar. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why. I don't know. Well, Joe Bonamassa does it, but... Yeah, but I I mean, he's, like, at least plays places where he has, like, a bus and, like, security and stuff. Oh, yeah, he's got to. I have no... Besides joking about him, I have no context for how how big he actually is like what because i mean those like he's obviously like the latest iteration like when i was young it was like the people you would joke about it's like the joe satriani or steve Vai sort of like yeah guitar nerd kind of like where like nobody likes them but like <laughs> good people right and like yeah it's like but I, they ultimately they weren't playing stadiums they were playing like stuff like you know the fox theater or something like that yeah it, yeah you know what i'm saying so it's like i assume joe bonamass is the same kind of thing but i have no idea I mean, I don't know the music or anything about it besides people just making fun of him. <laughs> <laughs> I know, like, I've heard a little bit of his music and I was like, yeah, it's all right. I, I mean, why you would be interested in him is because of all the guitars he has. And that's. Is it like good or is it like, what is it like? I mean, it's just kind of like blues rock, you know, in, right. in, the, in a kind of. And I don't know, I can't even say whether he's a good player or not because it's like this thing that you know like specifically like the Les Paul does to people it's like it's like a mythology it's a myth building guitar so it's a brand it's a brand it's like you know people like will sell their soul for that guitar and uh I don't know anyway is, this I, dude, is the weird dude still in charge of Gibson who like put the tuners on the back of everything <laughs> I think okay Gibson went through like bankruptcy a couple of years ago and they got a new a new corporate overlord to run it who seems to be doing a little better because cause it's like that's the thing with these like legacy companies they can I think Fender can do it better than Gibson can do it where they're, they're like let's introduce some new stuff a little bit it can be like a familiar model but like let's change it a little so that the kids will like it and they do we'll make it in fun colors and make it so the kids can afford it and they do you know yeah, Fender still puts out stuff every once in a while that's like I like like yeah ultimate like people are bashing the rumbles for a little while but that's like in terms of like a combo it sounds great like yeah that's a good smaller bass amp that's awesome. a good amp yeah and oh. like I don't know they still innovate in ways where I'm like okay like every once in a while and I'm not saying this because at some point I was sponsored by Fender because that is true but I was also like you know, I like I like what they do. Like they don't do some crap too, but like I don't know. They yeah. just, they pull out stuff that like makes sense, even if it's not for me. Even if it's like a beginner guitar or something, and like people who are beginners actually play them, which means they succeeded. Yeah, I, I think they're probably more successful. I didn't yeah. I didn't hear about well Fender. 
I think they went through bankruptcy in the early 80s because they weren't really in touch with how to make good guitars anymore. It was just like a corp- right. the CB- CBS corporation until like 82 or something. Aren't there, isn't there like a fan contingency of those specific guitars too, though? Or am I remembering that wrong? People yeah. Are specifically into the CBS ones. Yeah, people like, like you know, the, the Coronado or something like that was like a, a kind of like a Gibson ES-335 Fender's version of that. And they, they made those with like, this is the weirdest thing they ever did, but they started to like put um inject different colored dyes into t- trees that were growing so this was like 66 67 or something uh Weird. yeah and i was like i always wanted to check one of those out because they look really fucking cool but uh ecologically that's not really environmentally yeah, i don't i don't logically su- ultimately you're cutting down trees to build fucking instruments anyway so yeah yeah, yeah. so you might as well do it the <laughs> the nicest way you can <laughs> if at all possible yes. if it all, i guess plant plant a tree for everyone you cut down is i guess but you know you can buy you can buy a lot of used guitars and they're still great uh but yeah it's like i'm trying to think of guitars or pieces that i bought new and it's like very 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 few yeah probably the best story i had and i got this new through the through, through being sponsored by them briefly but uh I didn't realize who this was until years later just because I don't give a shit about Led Zeppelin or anything to do with Led Zeppelin. But, like, that dude Tony Franklin who played bass on the firm with Jimmy Page after Led Zeppelin broke up okay. was, yeah. like, my artist rep or, rep or whatever there. So uh. I, like, talked to this, like, weird British dude. like And, and like, I broke a bass on tour. I called him. I was like, dude, can you, like, sell me a bass, like, now? And he was like, well, we have this one bass. It's new. I can sell it to you for like 300 bucks. And it was an American jazz music. So I was like, absolutely. I was like, what's the catch? And he's like, well, <laughs> it's the color. Of, people say it's the color of semen. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, that's fine. I don't care. And I get this bass and it's like, I still own it. I mean, it's awesome. It's like this perfect American standard jazz bass mm-hmm. with this kind of like, it kind of, to me, it looks more like a, like a silver flying saucer kind of like, I never would look at that. Like, oh, that's cum. But I guess enough yeah. people are like, oh, no, 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 that guitar looks like cum. That, like they didn't sell any of them oh okay i i know the one you're talking about then yeah 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 i actually looked one up the other day because i was like just curious like what 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 one would cost and like i can't remember the exact name but it's like was a weird stretch because nothing about that it's just i don't know you know when sometimes people look at shit and you're just like and you're like why is that what you saw that is weird yeah it's, yeah like uh it's like new mexico skyline on the third of november at 7 p.m gray and you're like what it's purple <laughs> but even that makes more sense than cum yeah <laughs> that was the weird thing when you were just like what something's wrong dude you go to the doctor because <laughs> if that looks like silver spray paint you got a problem <laughs> anyways yeah i'm not in the market i mean like everything i buy is used like i've kind of been more focused on drums the last couple of years and like that's been like i didn't know anything about drums until playing them basically so like that's kind of going on the thing with like, like I would sort of you know learn to play guitar a little bit to participate in songwriting. Like mm-hmm. ultimately, primarily, like I'm just participating in songs and also kind of pick up whatever I need to participate. Yeah. And late, that's been more drums, which like some stuff you have to buy new, pretty much, like in terms of hardware and like sticks and crap like that. But yeah, you know, I'm sure you can you can obviously still buy new drums, but that's not really what I'm. So so it's the same kind of thing with bass and guitar. Yeah. Yeah, so you are you're about to go on tour with Lung? Uh, as long as you know the Delta variant doesn't shut down everything, yeah. Yeah. We're playing in a we're playing a festival called Mild of Music this coming week in Wisconsin, which is all outdoor, which should be pretty fun. Yeah. And then, okay. then we're putting out a record, and then we're going on tour. We're opening for Max Sabbath for two months. So. Oh, Max Sabbath. So. Um. Perhaps should you explain maybe to our listeners? We're, we're not live or anything, but Max Sabbath is that? Um, what do they do? I know who that is, but um, they are a band that plays Black Sabbath songs, but with lyrics about uh, McDonald's. McDonald's. Okay, right, right, right. I've seen a couple yeah, of those. That's like that. yeah, it's pretty awesome. That's awesome, and and um, yeah, I I really like what Lung does too. By the way, which is. Uh, I don't know. So it's it's like electric cello, 
right? Yes. And vocals uh, by Kate Wakefield, right? Um, yes, and I play drums. And you play drums. And it has a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of crossover and amplification. I could talk your ear off about the, uh, about the, with the, both of us having like limited, not real like technology, sound knowledge, just like trial and erroring a lot of things with an electric cello, which is, for cello also isn't something you can buy, like it's a student cello mm. that she like pulled the guts out of with that dude Clinton for Mr. Flies helping and uh, put in like some kind of weird pickup. Mm. Like a, I think it's a bass pickup or something, but it like, it's more like for whatever reason it does it in a certain way that like, it's a hotter pickup, I guess is the term. I don't know for sure. I'm not good at this up. Yeah. Then it's supposed to be in there. So it like really live. It's very like live and kind of like aggressive sounding for being a cello. And like, and then that gets run into like, we have a like GK 700 RV kind of set up for like the lower end. Mm-hmm. And then like a 215, we've been playing with a bunch of them or a 212 with a PB, uh, base 400 for like the high end which i still think is one of the best guitar amps ever to exist even though it's a bass amp (laughs) yeah they make good stuff we don't quite do the octave like you know how like every band that's a two-piece they like have the octave all the way up and it just kind of sounds like you know talking about uh they they use the octave for dynamics and like every song has like an octave guitar part oh and i do that like we sort of like yeah use the octave a little bit and then like eq the bass so it, it like gets the bass end of it like accentuates like the lower the lower harmonics that are already there rather than being like here's another part that's playing with the same part that's knocked it out mm-hmm. so that's basically how that goes we tweak it a whole bunch and do weird stuff so and Kate has got like went from being kind of like if I just want like one or two pedals that are on all the time to like during the pandemic has been like oh wow there's a lot of pedals and I can do tons of stuff with them. she's been like effect nuts lately and just like going through tons of stuff and like coming up with like new crazy sounds every every practice like i come in and there's something new that's like totally awesome so yeah and and you can uh do a recreate a lot of stuff live with with the setup you have or uh, is it difficult um i mean we always gear towards how we're going to do something live like we're not like we record, like we do crazy stuff. We record, but it's mostly like, okay, how do we, how do, if this works, how do we work it into playing? Yeah, for sure. Like it has to serve the set. It has to serve the song. Right, right. Yeah, you probably. Um, I imagine you might be a little better at doing that than than the actual White Stripes were. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which is. I don't know, man. I, was, I didn't see them after they got big. Like they played my hometown a bunch of times right like probably in the two or three years before they were like huge oh okay now, to be fair like they kind of ripped I mean it was like <laughs> very grodgy at that point in time but like they knew what they were doing like it sounded good yeah yeah I'm also not the biggest White Stripes fan for as much as like you know there's Meg, Meg White content in my life like I like <laughs> them but I'm not like a diehard or anything right I, I feel that you know you know, if I get in trouble for saying this, I, I don't know. That Jack White's kind of, like, really full of himself for some reason. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know the guy. I mean, I had a friend who was a babysitter for a while. <laughs> and, like, or his nanny, I guess, whatever you call that. He lived, I, I don't know exactly what happened. But, like, I was told we have very similar personalities. So take that as you will. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I like you. I like you. All right, so... <laughs> I mean, that dude also has way more resources to do whatever weird stuff that he wants to do than I do, so... And has been that way since he was in his early 20s, so... Yeah. You know, maybe I'd be like that if I was super rich and famous, too. <laughs> it always seems like a Billy Corgan thing where, like, exactly half the people I know who've dealt with him are like, oh, he's cool, and half the people are like, oh, my God, he's horrible. <laughs> right, right. Which is always interesting when it's not, like, one or the other. It's like a dead split. Mm-hmm. But, I don't know, I've never met him. Yeah, I mean... People have personalities that, like, can be endearing to some people and, like, just acerbic to others, so... Exactly. It's just... I mean, dude is obviously kind of quirky. Like, he's Jack White, so... <laughs> he's Jack White. Yeah. I don't like his other bands at all. I only... Like, the White Stripes are the only one where I was like, okay, cool, this is this is interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was I was sitting around my you know my dad's house and my mom's house a lot of the time, like playing White Stripes music on this like Les Paul that I have, which was a it was a cool thing to have when when I was so young. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, very cool. I it didn't it didn't match the White Stripes color scheme necessarily, but this Bass Six does. Well, like, there you go. Now you can be the White Stripes. <laughs> I can be the ba- the Bass Sixist of the White Stripes. There you go. They never really they had a base. Back together. Call Meg. She, what, she's down the road, right? <laughs> she's just down the road. Michigan is like, uh, it's as big as a stone's throw. Well, why don't you walk down the lane <laughs> to Meg's cottage and knock on the door and be like, hey, I think we should send send a telegram to Jack and we should get the band back together and I'll be the base sixist. <laughs> so I'll invite you in for a cup of grog. Grog, yeah. And know some traditional michigan uh i don't know what is traditional michigan food conies conies and like i think stewed stewed euchre cards um, stewed euchre cards and conies yeah and you all will form a new band i think it's a great idea nothing could go wrong <laughs> this will definitely happen i like that um yeah you got to send jack a telegram because that's that's the only way meg communicates and if Jack has his way, that's the only way he communicates. Right. Well, I mean, but. Michigan doesn't have phones yet, right? Oh, right. I, yeah, I borrowed this phone from Indiana. That's right. And I, well, they only have, they, they have, what, two or three at max? Yeah, I have to walk down the road and bring this back to them that's just before the seven. That's just Chicago, which has nine phones total. <laughs> it has some of the, some of the most phones in the country, Chicago. It's close. It's close. New York, I think, has nine and a half and Los Angeles has 11 now they just got a new <laughs> extra half <hour. laughs> yeah that's what happened I think I think these are all true facts in this day and age what whatever you say is just true so. I have a question yeah how do you feel like the fact that essentially the biggest new rock band of the, of the whole 2000 like 2000s decade didn't have a bass player how do you think that affects both A, the perception of the bass player in rock music, and B, sales of basses? Oh, wow. Uh, the, per- the perception. I don't know. Be- well, since I was young and listening to the White Stripes, you know, I was a, a teenager, kind of when they got big, early teen. Um, and I formed a band with a couple of my friends, and we didn't have a bass player unless my dad was playing bass. Uh, usually, and he was like really good, but then I was a teenager, so sometimes I'd be like, "Can can we just do it, you know, with young people?" And so we, don't, <laughs> you know, just being a teenager, and I, I just I just actually interviewed my dad. It was his first like interview about music in his whole life, and he's like sixty two. Did uh, you did you talk about that anecdote where you were like, "Dad, come on, <laughs> people don't do bass." <laughs> Not really. I, I mean, and he he just like he let us play one show. Not let us. I mean, we were just like, don't play. But he helped us bring everything to the gig and was That's there awesome. the whole time. Yeah, he's awesome. I, I mean, I'm questionable, but or, or back then, you know, like 16 years ago. But uh, yeah, so I mean, that the White Stripes not having a bass player and the, the Black Keys, too they didn't have a bass player and it's like it worked because it was very garagey but you know i i really like low end even on the guitar i like have the bass on the amp you know up higher than the treble in the mids you know etc etc and i like tuning down and i like you know i like the bass six and i like all that so i like low end so i would prefer to have low end going on all the time I do feel like it, I mean, I do too, obviously, yeah. but like, it just made it for a little bit like, like, kind of like people didn't understand what a bass was. Sure. Like, even in Foxy Shazam, like, there was kind of this, like, I mean, to be fair, I play bass kind of loud, so this is not <laughs> entirely like, out of turn, but like, there was always this kind of recurring arguing about like, like, is the bass too loud or is it louder than the guitar or like, whatever. Whereas, like, then when the bass went too quiet, 
part of because of the nature of that band, part of just in general, like everything would sort of like drift apart when they couldn't hear me as like a tonal center. Yeah. To connect drums, especially between the, you know, the guitar and the piano, which was a recurring problem in that band. Mm-hmm. But like every, like, you know, it, it would always go, I don't know, whatever, you don't need a bass player. Like, I think Eric would be like, well, Prince says if you could hear the bass, it's too loud. Like, okay, guy. Yeah, we're not, this isn't Prince and the Revolution, but what? anyways, I digress. Like, it's in, in terms of just, in terms of rock music, like, yeah. you need some bass presence. I think. And it needs to be obviously felt, but also heard. Yeah. Kind of room together, so to speak. Right. I feel like a lot of people just, that, that kind of got lost on a whole weird generation. And I've seen, like, you know, many, many, many two piece bands where, you know, there's no low end. Yeah. And, and then, right. I wonder. Right, is that directly because of the White Stripes that, you know, um, maybe people... Uh, yeah, I think I think you're onto something because uh, I remember, you know, back 20 years ago or something, like, people didn't want to play bass necessarily. You know, even myself, like, if I, I was in, uh, you know, Mercury Cross or Arcana as we started out, uh, and they, like, fired their bass player because she wasn't that good and they saw they saw me play guitar and asked me if i wanted to play bass in their band right so th- that's how that is and it's like i wouldn't i don't prefer to play bass but if if i'm doing it i i really want to get into it and do it well because i realize the function of it as a as a huge like tonal center despite you're the- really particularly good with like like when you did the bass six thing where you kind of go back and forth bass the part i thought that was a really cool answer to it and like I mean, I also sometimes will play, like, up high lines and then, you know, sort of hold it down in other parts. Like, it kind of depends on the part, but, like... Yeah. yeah it seems like there was a weird little gap. Mm-hmm. You know what the, you know what the like, if you were in college in the 2000s and you lived in, like, a city big enough that everybody thought they were cool, you know what the, you know what the version of this was? What's that? It was post-rock bands, like, bands where there's not a singer. Like, it was, like, sort of like... Oh! Like, and so, like, Explosions in the Sky got big out of nowhere... Mm-hmm. And like suddenly every band had nine minute songs with like two chords. Yeah. And like we're projecting shit in the background. Like it was always like it's the same kind of thing. And it was like right when the white stripes got big was somehow every band like every local band in where I'm from at least, like like suddenly it was like this excuse to like not have a singer. <laughs> Which is really so, funny. Okay, so they were cutting out either the bass player or the singer. Uh, interesting. Yeah, because you you could find. Obviously, I was in a band w- technically like, as the young people, it was just like me and my friend Glenn. We played guitar and wrote songs and and sang. So it was like, we were like dual leaders, and then there was like a drummer, who was our friend too, and so that was easy to find. And that like I lived with the bass a, bla- a bass player is my dad, so I was set, but. If it was just up to the young folks, we would not have had a bass player, which is interesting. <laughs> and then, I like that your dad just showed me, he's like, I'm going to play. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I mean, he, we were talking in like, you know, I knew he played in bands and stuff since like the 70s. Uh, but, you know, the moment that I showed interest in, I was like, hey, dad, where are those cases in the basement? He's like, OK, cool. You know, now that you're into it. I'm going to like, just get, just bring these up and get more stuff around the house. So it was, it was the nurturing, uh, <laughs> I want to say the nurturing nature of bass players that started this whole thing for me. So, uh, I got to appreciate the bass. It's pretty cool. I mean, there's definitely a lot you can do with it. It's, I mean, not as much as the bass six, but there's a lot of, there's still a lot to be said with the instrument musically, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, there are people who do a lot more than I could ever do on six strings with four strings. So, so your podcast is, is mostly about the basics, right? Yeah, well, it's... it's uh, I don't know. This is turning into a thing where, like, I was going to use some, you know, some sound clips and stuff from this for my basics video. Uh in the in the YouTube series, but I was thinking like I've had three good interviews today, and like 
I wonder if I should just post these interviews on YouTube. I mean, would you be okay with that? I don't care. Do whatever you want with it. Okay. Up Thank to you. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate it. Because like, I was thinking about bass players who were good who used to interview. Like, uh, CJ Boyd is really good. He's doing a lot of stuff. He's yeah. always been. He's always doing a lot of bass stuff. And I'm like, okay, that's that's changing how I'm how I'm feeling about that. How I'm thinking about the instrument. Yeah, I mean, if you if you have like people you think I should talk to eventually for for any project, I mean, I appreciate I'll that. that. I'll definitely hit you up with that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I don't know. Let me know what else you what else is good to say. I don't know what else. I'm rambling now, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean. That's I, I had no idea how much you had to say about the base six, uh, you know, initially because you're like, yeah, I, I sold it. Um, so, but I, yeah, I assumed you recorded some cool stuff with it, and that's that's what I've been doing with it. I gave it I give it about like a B plus. Sure. I, know, I also don't know exactly what else I'd do with it, what to make it different. It's just like I just had a hard time and limited patience for like get it because it felt like. I already had two instruments that did everything that I could do with it, but then it for I also wasn't playing live at the time. Like this is this is the period right after Foxy Sazam broke up and I was like basically just like did a bunch of different stuff for a year or two musically that was kinda like all over the place. And none of it's ever been released because it's all terrible. But like <laughs> like I tried to teach myself to sing. Like I did like uh you know what slow core is, right? Like codeine, like super, super slow. I could, yeah, I could picture that kind of, yeah, that sound. Like, I did, like, a whole slow core cover of that System of a Down album, Toxicity, to try and teach myself to sing, and, like... Whoa. Terrible. It's not good. <laughs> that actually, the, the basics got used on a lot of that, and I was just, like, trying to, like, just, like, learn how to do it, and it was, like, horrible. Like, I'm just not a singer. I'm not good at it. But, uh... I like I the... Did that. I did a bunch of, like, electronic stuff. Like, I did a bunch of stuff that was sort of, like, bass-led kind of pop stuff, and, like... Yeah. Just road, road, road. Also, I did that band Babe Rage with. It was most. It's mostly my wife's project with our friend JJ. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. We did that for about a year. Mm-hmm. So there's like a bunch of different stuff that was all happening, but like, mo- like Babe, Babe Rage played out, but that was it. Like everything else was like, you know, just no like noise rock or like whatever kind of stuff that I was just coming up with on my own. Like just a pile of different, several different piles of stuff, none of which really panned out i mean ultimately i'm a pan person like i get kind of bored working alone like sure my, yeah. own, my own ideas tend to bore me after a while so yeah right I get more excited when there's people to bounce stuff off of so yeah that is more exciting and uh i've been doing that with with my partner leo and we made stuff under the name uh deep fried butterfly now nice and uh yeah a lot of it is kind of like noisy and stuff but yeah we're we're just here in like our our one our one room that we have apartment and uh it's really nice but yeah just like using it as a studio and just like having someone to bounce that stuff off of I, i'd like to use the base six on that because i don't know it's just so different and i kind of look at it like uh like a guitar player but you know, like I'm noodling around on the higher frets and stuff, but have you have like the open B string or something, and that's as low as right. like the lowest B on a guitar already. So you're just like adding a melody and harmony harmony to that, and then then you can go up and like really step on the distortion or something and play the low notes, and it just sounds like something else, a new planet. Exactly. It's, it's all there. It's cool. I think if I was playing live more, I probably would have kept it. Like, many of that stuff ended up being stuff that I was actually playing with live. But it's like, the only live things I did is I played in Babe Rage, and then I played in this, uh, like, metal, kind of, like, hardcore, like, sludgy kind of band called Flesh Mother for, like, six months or something. And that was, like, a five-string bass, like, tuned down to G or something like that. Like, it was ridiculous. <laughs> but, like, that also was a different kind of thing. But Yeah. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the kind of, like, weird single note lines and like everything you describe I mean, you can kind of do stuff from like I don't know like Cure stuff to kind of like more modern stuff like I think Emma Ruth Rundle I, I can't remember if she uses a baritone or if she was using there's some stuff she did that I heard recently I was like holy shit that is awesome yeah but you know there's all sorts of crap mm-hmm. all sorts of good stuff music's cool <laughs> yeah it is that's that's the uh, conclusion I've come to today from talking to three people so far about music and just like letting the conversation flow 
I always write a lot of like notes and be like, oh, I should ask them this and, you know, but it all gets covered. I don't know. I think I'll ask Max, you know, later if I can get a hold of him, uh, more specific stuff about the basics if he's like a super big user of it. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, the last couple of times I've seen him play, that's all he did. Uh huh. That dude's cool. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to talk to him. Uh, anyway, uh, any other. Ask me some scandalous questions. Get, the con- get, get it going. Get me to say something, I'll get in trouble for it. Get you, you want to get canceled today? Um, <laughs> or when we when we upload this, it'll be like. <laughs> Daisy said that Gibson guitars were not that good. There we go. We we'll get canceled over Gibson. That'll be what does it. Well, it's like everybody everybody knows that though. Like I know that Gibson guitars don't stay in tune nearly as well as Fenders or you know whatever stuff like that. The headstocks just like snap off. Like it's just, it's just like knowing that that happens and you just have to like get it redone. You know. Yep. Yeah, I've heard of that quite a bit. Um, what are the iconic, controversial, terrible things? I hate P bases. No, I, I take that back. For recording, sometimes they work really well. <laughs> I just don't like how they sound. Like, they sound good, like, in a specific, like, sort of role. But, like, I don't know. You're more of a jazz bass person, then. I'm so a jazz bass person. Yeah, that's funny, because, like, my, my dad is, like, super into P bases. And he's, he's like, really? kind of, he's built, like, Frankenstein ones. Is and, he a jazz bass hater, or is he just jazz bass neutral? I think he would definitely play one. We have like a, a, a jazz based copy, I think. I think it was like an early Ibanez or something. But so that one's pretty good. But yeah, he prefers the P bass. He made one that's like got like a, a Tele bass neck and he put like. He made it into like a hot rod, basically. It's got like flame stickers and stuff. <laughs> but that's, that's awesome. Yeah, that's the one he's played for like. 12 years or something I'm, I'm like over here like jumping from guitar to guitar like oh yeah yeah this is cool and he's like playing mainly one thing that's badass I, I used to be like that but I don't know there's a lot of guitars and stuff in the world that I gotta try so it's true <laughs> you know what's newer that's actually totally sounds good is the Fender Bronco bass like the really tiny one yeah like, I know a lot of people who use that it's like they're like you know hundred dollar bass at home for demos because I feel like you can get them for like literally nothing yeah, I had a Squire um, Bronco bass, and that was that actually sounded great. I like those. That, those are really good. Yeah. Weirdly, yeah. because it like looks like a child's instrument, so tiny. <laughs> but it totally sounds good. Yeah, I like the comically small and the comically oversized instruments now. You know, or like, what is it, instruments? But you're I, kind of the thing where people are snobby about short scale basses. I haven't really encountered it, but I could like probably sense that I'm sure at some time. I mean, it, it generally is like not saying this as a generality, but like it's usually kind of like a way to crack on someone who's not a man playing a bass. Oh, without saying that you're like sexist. Yeah, I or like transphobic or whatever. Like, there's a way. It always kind of has this flavor of like, okay, like this isn't macho enough for you. Like, if people have smaller hands and smaller bodies, they play smaller instruments like that's okay yeah there's nothing wrong with it that's it's that's one of those, like macho weird things like you know talking shit about meg white how that was like you know 15 10 years ago however long ago that was this yeah like, people, it sounds good it sounds good who cares like, people yeah. have like they have a thing about like women or femme people playing music and it's like can you just shut the fuck up just let <laughs> so let people play music let let everybody experience it's it's not about like like a white man show all the time you know it's just weird because it's like i feel like now people people who have that opinion can't really say that out front so they sort of invent these weird little like yeah door ways to talk shit to women or people who are non-binary or like yeah well anyone who's we'll just say not a dude not a dude and yeah like, so they'll just be these little inventions of like oh well, you do this and, blah, blah, and maybe, like whether it's like you know sort of like being condescending about the gear or sort of like whatever it's like okay like we get it you're uncomfortable shut up yeah there's so much of that like gatekeeping about like gear and i've been thinking about that because it's like you know most of the things on the series i've done have been like kind of you know affordable little things you know or I've, i've happened upon them and they didn't cost that much 
luckily. And right, it's like all about it's all about how you use something. Like I've seen people play instruments that are worth six figures and it sounded amazing. I've seen people play stuff on like literal one of a kind, like insured for billions of dollars instruments, like the uh, my God, what is it? That dude, Harry Parch. You know that is. Oh yeah, Harry Parch. Yeah. I saw the when Foxy Shazam lived in Los Angeles. I went to go see a performance of his music on these like giant instruments that are like insured for millions because they're like one of a kind with his weird like tonal system yeah these giant like like stuff like that which of course it's unreal it's amazing but i've also seen like like my friend grimly like make noise on literal garbage and it's amazing <laughs> yeah yeah like, we it just it's it depends on what you need and like being a snob about it like it's one thing to offer guidance yeah you once requested obviously but like yeah well, this is how this goes, and I know I have opinions like that. Like I'm very much like I don't really like strats. I don't like Fender guitars for the most part at all. Like I literally like how SG sounded. That's all it. But like mm. that's my stupid opinion. Like people can do whatever they want. I've heard tons of guitars sound awesome. Yeah. Or like you know I've, I've heard tons of guitars sound terrible. Like it just depends on what you want to do. Hmm. On what you want to do and who's who the player is and whether they know how to like play it. Exactly. Um. Yeah, that's why exploring gear is so cool because there's so much out there. Mm-hmm. You have to look into it, and, you know, see what's good. Yeah, I, I plan to keep doing it. Um, but don't stop. I'll there's, <laughs> I'll be mad. I'll be mad. I'll be sad. It's like there's a level of like, yeah, I. Some days I'm like, yeah, I have a lot of stuff and I love it all, and uh, why should I ever get any more? Uh, but then you you like meet something new, and it's like, oh boy, if I don't go home with this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, like, hate myself. Sometimes. I'm really not a big fan of the band Modest Mouse or Isaac Rock at all, mm-hmm. but he did say something I thought was smart in an interview recently where he was like, yeah, this, I don't, I'm paraphrasing, but like something like, this search for, like, a perfect guitar into a perfect amp is, like, time you could spend writing. Yeah. And I, I don't agree unilaterally, like, but, you know, That's a good, good point. Don't lose sight of one for the other, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yep, I, I'm like at an age where I'm like, I, remember how prolific I was when I was younger? And it was like the stakes weren't that high. Um, so lower the stakes now. You don't have to like make an album every year or anything, but. No, do, it, do what you want, do it to your pace. But I mean, like, just personally, like, I think I've kept a pretty steady pace through most of my life, including childhood, where I probably wrote a lot more on my own when I was younger. And mm-hmm. at certain points where, like, I wasn't in a main band, but I mean, like, some of this has to do with the fact that there's been a pandemic, we've been bored, but I mean, Lung is, like, we have one album that's about to come out in, like, a couple weeks mm-hmm. that we recorded last year altogether. There's another album that we recorded in 2019, and then there's a third album that will probably be a double album mm. that is written and needs to be recorded, and then also there's a split LP and a collaborative LP, so that's what like five records basically in the space of a couple of years like yeah and i'm like i mean foxy shazam had an issue where like we would write a lot but like virtually none of it would come out like it would be like like what was released was like 10 percent of what was written yeah like what me as a writer was very frustrating and it's bluntly like a source point a sore point within the band but like because a lot of it's like totally different and totally good just in a different way mm-hmm. but, whereas like I think there's a place. For, I mean, there's some. I mean, some songs suck for sure. But like, <laughs> I feel like, especially if people already like what you're doing, it's like, you know, as long as it's not like low quality. Like, if it shows a different sort of side, mm-hmm. I've heard that that's really cool. Yeah. So. Right. I I think like if there is such a high bar for quality, it, it, you know, that can really hinder the quantity of stuff you're even willing time you're even willing to put in to writing. People also mistake quality for, like, being, like, overly precious sometimes. And sometimes yeah. it's the opposite. Sometimes it's like, okay, cool, you didn't need to put out, like, you know. Because there's definitely artists where it's, like, the opposite, where there's, like, 40 albums, and it's, like, there's probably, like, you know, five good albums overall with, with all the songs across everything. Like, mm-hmm. so people get mad when I talk about Guided by Voices, so I won't. Oh, no. Uh, 
that okay if you want to get canceled let's go there <laughs> i mean i like some of it it's just like i like all of it there's a lot like there's like an insane amount to the point that it took me years to leave and like wade into it to like get to the stuff i want i mean there's worse sticker counts sonic youth is even worse like sonic youth it's like there's like a good album or two out of the whole thing for me personally mm, yeah I, I probably feel that way about sonic youth. like i i like guided by voices a lot but right that the amount that like Robert Pollard writes is just like no one can humanly keep up with that. That's fine, but which then again, on the other hand, it's kind of like a weird Sonic Diary, and he has the ability to do it. So I mean, like, it's, why not? It's kind of cool. Yeah, it's kind of like it's his language. So if he feels like recording it, I'm I'm on board. I I like the guy. Yeah, I mean, more power to him. I mean, dude's awesome. Like, I like their band. It's just like yeah, it definitely is kind of like not how I would do it, which seems like the opposite of what I just said in terms of like putting out tons of stuff, but I feel like <laughs> it's more like the nature of different releases. Like I don't really endorse anything about this person's personality or like what they've done in the past 20 years really, but like in the nineties, Smashing Pumpkins would do this thing where there'd be like albums and then there'd be like these weird like B side records and box sets and weird like weird records you'd have to kind of track down. Yeah. And it's sort of, it was clear, it was like, okay, this isn't like the main record, but here's this weird little special thing. Yeah, and that's like a cool Easter egg thing for fans, which I, I appreciate that. Yeah, like as a, a fan, I think that's awesome. Like, that's a good way to look at it. in a really particular way where they sort of, I feel like all the weirder shit would end up on the B-sides. Mm-hmm. And like some of the songs were all honestly stronger than the album songs, they were just kind of a different kind of song. Yeah. Like, there's a couple songs that are, like, kind of funny, which is really weird for that band. Like, it's obviously meant to be, like, kind of entertaining. And, yeah. like, shit like that, where it's like, but as a fan, that just made me like it more. So it's not like, here's an album, an album, an album, album, like, album every year for 20 years or whatever. Although, if you can do that, I mean, good for you. But, like, there was sort of, like, it felt delineated what was, like, the album versus what was sort of, like, an interesting you know, side, side track that they went on to get there, mm-hmm. which I, I thought was like the perfect way to do it. But again, that band totally lost the plot on every level, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's, that's an interesting, uh, that's, I, I don't know. That's kind of the way I've been thinking. Actually, if, if I'm taking anything from Billy Corgan, don't take I'll, much from him. I would take his money, I suppose. Uh, take his, do you have any left? I don't know. I already bought a wrestling network, and then like, they had to do Smashing Pumpkins, like, fake, not really a reunion to or to, like, pay for it, basically. Oh, my God. A wrestling network? Do you not know about this? Dude, like, owns, like, some huge, like, I don't know how that works anymore, because, like, is cable TV even so real? Like, but, like uh... there's, like, a network that I guess is about wrestling or has wrestling on it, and he owns it or owned it or something, and it, from what I heard, was not... I think I read an interview, like the only interview in 20 years with your neighbor Darcy in Michigan down the road. And uh, Yeah, we go way back. Yeah. Yeah. Big, you, yeah, big D. You and Big D. Yeah. Big S and Big D. Um, <laughs> where they were, she was just like, oh yeah, he told me that like, he, he like, did it on the wrestling network. It was a bad investment. He needs to like, make the money back. And that's why they're doing the tour without me. Which, yeah. if you want to have a reunion, like, you should probably have everybody there. But, but you know, that's another touchy topic that'll probably get me yelled at. So. Leave the bass player out, right? Is that the logic? Yeah, see, if, if the bass player isn't a dude, it's cool. <laughs> Man, that was the most offensive thing in the world. I'm not going to say it. Never mind. I'm going to... I Never mind. <laughs> I'm going to say something I shouldn't say. Okay. Okay. Smashing Pumpkins are, you know, that was my favorite band when I was a kid, but man, they fucking... They took a turn. Or dude took a turn. Yeah, it's probably like an ego thing, I would imagine. Uh, I mean, but, but like... But you can have ego I and have quality. thing where people touch stuff, like, especially, like, in terms of really, like, emotive songwriters, mm-hmm. where there's, like, a hard turn at some point, where they just, like, totally lose the plot. Mm-hmm. Like, some people do this, some people don't. Connor Obers, love him or hate him, I don't feel like he ever quite got off of this plot. Like, yeah. I don't know if you quite understand, it's like, I don't know if it's, like, a conscious thing or what, but, like, that dude still seems like he ultimately is doing stuff musically that, like, has the same like emotional quality and the same like the quality of, of his music that, that people like. Okay. Or, yeah. like, or it doesn't. Like it feels like he totally just like forgot what was good about it entirely. Mm-hmm. Like after a very specific point. 
Yeah. Which I, I don't know. I guess that happens. But, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, that's a, that's the thing. You like, you have to keep your uh, eye on the prize or something. If you are a pretty yourself or what, I don't know. I, mean, yeah. I have no idea. I don't know what the it, if it, like self truth or you know just wanting to be famous or what. I have no idea what the motivation for either of those people is. So it's, it's just like at one point I connected with it, and at another point I didn't. Right. It's like you you grow older, and you know the music doesn't grow with you, but maybe it grows with someone else. Right. It's fine. Yeah. I just don't think anybody like no one's like wow I really love the new Smashing Pumpkins. No, never mind. I'm smashing this person. <laughs> They're fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. I'm just being mean at this point. Um, yeah. Yeah. Get Darcy on the show. See your show going. Come on. I yeah. I will walk down to um, Megan Darcy's compound. <laughs> it's about <laughs> it's about one cubit away, and uh, I don't know how big that is. Cubit. Yeah. I don't know. It sounds good though. It sounds, it sounds good. Like real thing. Yeah, I'll you know I'll I think this is maybe the beginning of a, of of a little podcast I'm doing. Who knows? I I feel bad like Tanner's just been sitting here like filming me talk on the phone, <laughs> and, and like I'm like well on the one hand it's like an easier project than what we've been doing. Tanner, uh, what's your input on all this? <clears throat> oh, this is great. This is great. This has been going very well. I'm appreciative. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna feed him some uh, Thanksgiving dinner leftovers that we we do that for Leo's birthday uh, every nice. year, every year. It's a Thanksgiving meal. That's uh, awesome. That's a good birthday meal. Yeah, yeah. So we're uh, I paid Tanner for most of his hard work in a in a guitar. So nice. for that, I up to a certain point I feel good about that but now, now after like making him sit and film me talking on the phone I, I feel like I need to give him something else but get him another, another guitar and Thanksgiving dinner another and guitar and Megan Darcy oh yeah you can cut we've, we're gonna have to film B-roll so we might as well go and hang out with Megan Darcy <laughs> do you think you could play guitar in their band yeah either of us uh, someone's gotta do it Indeed, does have to do it. That seems like oh a. God, what if it was like a Michigan All Star situation where it was like. Oh, let me think. Meg on drums, Darcy on bass. Uh, who's worst, Kid Rock or Bob Seger on guitar? <sighs> yeah, that's a big question. Who's worse? And, and where does Eminem fit in? He doesn't fit in, and that's, yep, that's been his problem. The insane clown boss you're going to sing. What's that? The insane clown boss you will sing. Oh, I I see. You are informing me again of the rich musical history of the state of Michigan. Michigan's awesome. I know, I know it is. I know it is. And, you know, Guided by Voice is an Ohio band. That's one of my favorite bands, really. Right. Every good band in Ohio is from Dayton, though. That's just how that works. Like, that's like. Oh, is it? Yeah. I mean, come on, man. Like Brainiac, the Breeders, Guided by Voices, uh, Swearing at Motorists. Hmm. Else? There's a lot. There's a lot. Of, I mean, even now, it's like Skirt, Page, Beller, and like Cream Boy and stuff like that. That's like unbelievably good. Like Dayton's just got it going on. Like it's that's that's the spot. Yeah. Is is it? What do you think it is? The location or the history of good band? I don't know. That might help. <laughs> Honestly, don't know. Everybody there's kind of weird, but in a good way. Oh, that's Not what it is. Like, I don't know. Like they don't really sound like each other. Like Cincinnati, Cincinnati's got better about this. Like Cincinnati used to be like, if there was one like sort of successful local band, like everybody would instantly sound like that band, and it was really embarrassing. And I thought it was super stupid for a long time. It's gotten past that. Like there's kind of a different. There's been like a generational sea change, and it's gotten a lot more interesting musically. I think, but like for years, it was like. Like, I mean, Foxy Shazam started doing really well, and, like, all these bands, like, became, like, weird, like, bootleg Foxy Shazams. Like, not tons, but, I mean, there were, like, three or four, and it was, like, okay. Yeah, I... Kind of weird, but okay, whatever. I could see that, you know, that probably happens everywhere, but, you know, if if you're down on the ground observing it, you know, right in the the scene, 
and you're like one of the originators of the of a sound or a of a kind of setup because you you know you had trumpet in your band that's and then then it's like people would pick like one or two things from the band and sort of rip it like i'm not gonna name names because some of them are my friends but i mean like there would either be like a real zany singer who like said crazy (laughs) stuff or like there'd weirdly be like a completely inappropriate keyboard player (laughs) or like like someone who played horn sometimes and it would be kind of like sort of stylistically similar musically but not 100 percent. yeah and god everybody's gonna kill me for this and it was i don't know it was weird i don't know i don't it was only really weird when it was like bands that like played like new metal and then suddenly started doing that like that was kind of strange but i mean again it's whatever I don't, obviously boxy just wasn't like really like was was plowing musical ground that had already been plowed anyways like we weren't like you know some originators of some crazy new sound like we were a rock band Sure. Yeah. I mean, but we're trying to be the best fucking rock band we possibly could. But like, yeah, some of the some of the like surface level accoutrement of the band definitely like it was funny to watch people locally sort of adopt it the same way like you know you know suddenly like bands have been sort of when I was younger there would be these sort of like rip off like bootleg. Afghan wigs or ass ponies bands where there would be this sort of like either the singer would be wearing sunglasses or there'd be kind of like some, this Americana kind of mm-hmm. uh, cancel for shit talking Cincinnati <laughs> I don't know I'm from Louisville dude like we're the same as Dayton like every band from there is kind of weird and like mm-hmm. I don't know if your band is like not original you get made fun of and like Cincinnati that Cincinnati doesn't have the same thing like people are a little bit like people aren't as forthcoming with critique in the music world, which I think in some ways is good. And ultimately what happened is like just a lot of different weird people ended up moving here. And then like in the last 10 years, there was just like a really good, especially like 2011 to like 2017 or so. There was like these crazy cross genre shows where there'd be stuff like Jennifer Simone playing, who does like these like long form, like loops. And then like, mm-hmm there'd be a hip hop act and then there'd be like a noise rock band and there'd be someone who spoke a word. And then like someone would do some weird performance art thing, playing trumpet in the car. <laughs> like my friend John Hancock does like, that's what that's was one of the things he did. Yeah. Like, and it was like really cool for a while. And like that sort of died out for reasons, but like, mm-hmm. I don't know. That's kind of more interesting to me than just like a bunch of bands trying to get famous by copying some other band. So definitely the 2010s for me in Cincinnati. I like it better than like, decade yeah yeah that's interesting like thinking of you know people or bands that are like trying to make it versus people who are just like being themselves that's which you can do both it's just like you can you can do both. like i don't know like if that's your whole aim that seems really boring to me yeah i i've kind of let go of like hoping that i'm ever like super famous or anything but I wouldn't. I wouldn't kick it out of bed being famous necessarily. Still, I don't know. I got but, close enough to it that like fame does weird shit to people. Like I don't. Yeah. Like I've never been famous. Like I was in a band that like we did okay, and we were kind of at like the very bottom of like the major label world. And like sure, yeah, yeah. I was around a lot of people who I watched change because of like even the little bit of attention we got, and I saw. Mm-hmm people's priorities change and people's like not even as much in the band as you would think because ultimately like I mean Eric was always like well I want to be the biggest band in the world so it's like he really Mm -hmm. he was always he was already kind of there in a weird way and kind of just stayed how he is and like yeah that works for him that's but that's already kind of how he was where other people we were around and even in the band like there wasn't a whole lot of like all right we're rock stars now like I mean there's a little bit of it but I mean it's ultimately like we were working musicians who were trying to be good, mm-hmm. but we were around people who either were already famous. Like, okay. Like that band panic at the disco. Like mm-hmm. those, we toured them a lot. Like I'm not really close to them anymore. But, like they're nice dudes. Like I enjoyed being around them. Like every time, like we'd hang out, they were not, they, I liked them, you know? Yeah. But then it would be, Oh, let's go to a bar. And it'd be like, Oh yeah, we can't, we can't do that. Cause like, there's like 400 screaming fans outside of a door who will like do crazy shit. Like put, give them like, baked goods with hair in it and stuff like that. Like, who, like, wanted to hex them or whatever. Like, they couldn't live normal lives. I know. It's like, yeah, there's the threshold. Like, 
Yeah, you, like, they're nice dudes who seem like that, what, like, obviously that's what they do for a living, and they're, like, smoked on it, but, like, it didn't seem good. It seemed like as if they were under siege, and it was like, okay, cool, our friends can't go do this with us because they're scary people who will, like, tear their clothes off. Yeah, and... and, like, and that doesn't sound good or healthy on any level, and, like, people who are super pursuant to that, like, there are a few bands we were around who had much greater success than we did. Mm-hmm. And some of them were nice, and some of them were, like, bluntly, like, assholes. Like, just not good people at all. Yeah. And, like, usually the ones who are really, really pushing out front for it. Mm-hmm. To the point that they were sort of, like, shitty to people they were around. And, like, I don't know. And ultimately, like, the, the, all of those people, like, they're not making records anymore. Mm-hmm. Like, the people are still doing it, like, and who were, you know, a little more genuine and also, like, had ambition, which there's nothing wrong with, like, I don't know. They they seem to keep doing stuff and you know maintain their love for music and stuff. It just I don't know. Yeah, fame is something to aim for rather than something that's like a byproduct of something you do. Definitely seems weird to me. So, like I'm definitely not trying to. I've never been like, yeah, I'm gonna be world famous. Like it's never like that. It's like I want to be a working musician and like play shows and connect with people, have fun. Yeah, you you want to like enough of a living at it, or at least the realistic thing with a living seems more like you make some of your money at it and then you make the rest of your money somewhere else like yeah and cool. that's that's something you can just you can reckon with you know if you're having enough fun in your life then how you make money is kind of like hopefully secondary Ho- i mean hopefully you have a, a good enough you know cushion uh, right but, i mean like the way most people including me do it at this point is like you make some money playing music and then you make other money elsewhere like mm-hmm I do stuff. I make buttons for people. I bartend. Right. I do fill in labor. Mm. Just you know, kind of a buffet of little stuff that I can do when I'm not doing music to sort of like fill in the gaps as much as possible. Yeah. But yeah, the I, I don't know that the fame thing, especially with like I know I was in a band that like was titular like the, the the mission statement of the band was to be the biggest band in the world, which like I think is more funny than realistic, but also yeah. It was, like, five or six people with that with ambition which worked well for a long time but our ambitions you know ultimately were a little different which is that's fine how that works sometimes yeah if you're in a if you're in a band with that many people it's like you're i mean you you can have a mission statement and go about it pretty well for a while i think but then it's just like you've got five or six different destinies really that you're gonna go off into and if it ends up amicable you know that's the best situation yeah Uh, I mean, I still consider pretty much everybody who's in that band a friend, like, mm-hmm. like their family. Like, I'm not, I'm not trying to talk shit or anything. We just, I'm not in the band because there's some stuff, you know, some stuff we fundamentally disagree on about band, but that's fine. Like, I'm not. Yeah, sure. I don't hold it against them. They're still doing it. They're doing kind of a different thing now. Mm-hmm. I like a lot of it. I think a lot of it's actually really cool. It's just not what I want to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, how long have we been talking now? One hour, 18 minutes and one... four seconds. <laughs> well, that's, that's pretty good. I mean, do you have any other thoughts? I I, uh, I like everything we got into. I, I had I'm no... Not, give me to say something scandalous. I don't... I'm, give me the... No, I'm just kidding. That's not a good idea. <laughs> in, in Michigan, they're all trolls and they live on one road. <laughs> but You want to hear a great long story? Yeah. Yeah. So, Kate, Kate is a Michigander. Oh, Kate cool. Is from, from Ann Arbor. Nice. And uh, we played a show in Grand Rapids. Mm-hmm. And, like, you know how there's that weird, like, rivalry between Michigan and Ohio? Like, yeah. I don't know. I don't take it seriously because it's goofy. But, like, <laughs> basically, we were playing, and then, like, and it was a good show. And we were like, man, this is awesome. We live in Ohio, and it kind of sucks. Like, we're going to move here. Like, just kind of being <laughs> jokey. And, like, this dude cornered me and was like I think that's really messed up that you said that I'm from Cincinnati too and I'm told everybody you said that was Cincinnati and I had to have this like draining like 20 minute conversation hmm. with this weird drunk trucker dude <laughs> about like why it's not okay to try to say something bad about your home state or another state it was like really weird it was like I kind of wanted to walk away but I also kind of felt bad because I like bugged him hmm. and I guess his wife did the same thing to Kate but Kate just like totally was just like oh my god this is you know ridiculous because it was and just kind of like you know, 
apologize profusely because that's honestly probably a better reaction to this. And I'm, you know, again, in the Jack White category where I'm going <laughs> to argue with somebody for a long time. But, I mean, I guess I saw his point, but it was kind of weird. Like, it was just kind of like, okay, man, it was a joke. Like, it was said jokingly. It was a good crowd. We're having fun. Yeah. Like, obviously, with Pete Cincinnati, we live there. Like, it's a joke, man. <laughs> you, Yeah, you can say that about where you live, and it's. I think you're allowed to do that. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's like, okay, man, like, it's a joke. It's a joke. Calm down. Like, this isn't, this isn't like a serious, you know, condemnation of the entire state of Ohio in favor of Michigan because of some weird sports, sports rivalry. But like, you know. Yeah, if that's all it is, I, I mean, there was, I think there was a literal war about Toledo, but. No, we won, so get over it. Yeah, you got Toledo. Somehow, like, we got the UP out of that deal. I don't know how that makes any sense. I don't know the history. See, like the UP should be its own state, but I guess you guys need those extra two people up there to pad out your it, eight total, nine total. It should. I think we're about to move up there, maybe. We're trying to. Where are you? We're trying to move to Calumet in, uh, uh, in the Keweenaw Peninsula, yeah. So that would be that would be four people. What's that? Me and, me and Rochelle went to, like, northern Michigan. Because I've never really been above, like, Bay City. Mm-hmm. Um, hold on one second. I'm putting a leash on. Okay. okay. He's in the ER, so I'm watching his dog for him. Oh, okay. He stabbed himself with garden shears. Ah. Uh... Um. Oh, my God. Why is this so difficult? There we go. <laughs> um. Man, I loved it. Like, that's almost like a whole different place. It is, yeah. Like, and it's not really like Wisconsin or Minnesota. It's like its own little flavor. I, lo- I loved it, man. Mm-hmm. I really enjoyed it. We didn't really go. It was like during the, like, Corona era. Yeah. So, like, we were sort of just like, you know, camping and, like, not and like, eating out of the car, but, like, mm-hmm. I don't know. We had a nice time. Yeah. It, it's, real- it's that kind of place where you can just, like, whatever you're doing, you're just around, like, a lot of really nice nature, so you don't care. Yeah. Yeah. Sleep wherever you can, eat wherever you can, but you're enjoying it. Yeah. I like the UP. Yeah. I like Michigan in general, though, so I'm just an easy soul. <laughs> well, I like Ohio, too. Actually. I don't know if I go as far as that. No, I'm not <laughs> Daisy Kaplan wouldn't go as far as to say he likes Ohio. <laughs> I'm from Kentucky. I'm not legally allowed to like Ohio. Oh, yeah. So you're, are you from uh, Louisville? Okay, so that I'm just, I like Ohio, but Ohio, much like Michigan, is like like Cincinnati is a very different place than like Cleveland or Toledo or Athens. Like those are all yeah, remarkably different places. Yeah, all of them I love in different ways, but they are super different. Mm-hmm. Well, good. We've got we've gotten a lot of perspective today so far in these interviews, uh, and we've we've got some pure Michigan folks, and we've got a pure a con, pure Kentucky folk. <laughs> What is the is Ohio State slogan? Is it Ohio is for lovers? I think so. I've seen that one. Dude, Lung played with him in West Virginia. With who? Sorry. With Hawthorne Heights. Oh, with Hawthorne Heights. It was wild. Wow. Wow. They're nice. I don't, I didn't, I'd be real, I never heard a note of their music before that night. It's <laughs> a little bit like, I'm old, so. Yeah, that, that was. Really that was like what some kids liked when I was like 17 or something, but I, I only knew like one song. Yeah, I think the only thing I knew about it was like Victory Records trying to get people to like steal their records or whatever, something, I don't remember. Oh. Or steal like rap records or something and put Hawthorne Heights records in there. Some weird like <laughs> vaguely racist fucking Victory yeah. Records bullshit. Yeah. But I was holding it's Hawthorne Heights. I think they sued him over that if I remember correctly. Anyways, I'm talking about Hawthorne Heights. You should probably love to go. On yeah, on Hawthorne Heights, we can reach no higher. No, that's I, that's the end of it. Unless yes. you have any more questions, because obviously I'm rambly and will say things. So. Oh, I I don't think I do. I think this this has been a nice uh, hour and hour plus, and I think we might as well put this on YouTube if you don't care. I don't Some, care. Someone might. Meg White and Darcy are joining Hawthorne Heights on base. <laughs> Everything I've said in this interview is true. Yeah, it's Daisy Kaplan with the absolute scoop about the rock and roll world. Thank you. Billy Corgan. Billy Corgan is starting. A, Billy Corgan is starting a a, a tweed core band with Mike Lindell from My Pillow. <laughs> Donald Trump's putting out their records. All one hundred percent 
true. <laughs> Donald Trump is putting out. That's what we can. <laughs> Billy Corgan's duo record. Yeah. All right. Well, thank Bobby you. West is joining Marcy Playground. Oh. This yeah. Hey, this is a really specific thing, and I want to run it by you, and then I'll, I promise I'll let you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, you know, tweet like beat happening stuff like that, right? Sully Crash, all that business. Like, are you familiar with that kind of stuff? Like '90s indie, sort of like super simple. Oh, like Twee, you're saying? Twee. Yeah. Okay. You know what I'm talking about though. Uh yeah, vaguely. I I, I think I, I grasp. Feel it. Like, okay, so Marcy Playground to the White Stripes. I feel like we need because people are always like, oh, it's like post like post grunge gets used to sort of like label a catch all. Right, of everything that happened between, like, 1996 and 2001 or so. Yeah. I think there's a micro genre of corporate twee. <laughs> and I think it's basically the White Stripes and Marcy Playground, where it's sort of, like, like beat happening, but kind of, like, beefed up mm. in different ways. Like, Marcy Playground's a little more grunge, White Stripes is a little more, like, garage rock. Mm-hmm. But it's, like, the simplicity thing, but, like, you know produced you know simplicity produced yeah all right yep corporate twee yeah this is a thing i've been thinking about it lately yeah all right that's all i got that's the end of my that's the end of my mind (laughs) (laughs) the end of my mind well that's been a very interesting uh walk around your mind and i appreciate it this is thanks for talking to me thanks for recording me yeah thank you for talking to us and uh hopefully we'll talk again sometime uh have a good tour I, I hope that you know for everyone's sake the delta variant is not so bad you know, that, too. me and Rochelle got it it sucked pretty bad I mean, we're vaccinated so mm. it's definitely something to take seriously but yeah yeah definitely but you know get vaccinated wear a mask yeah and then you can uh participate in the vaccine lottery i think both of our states have that <laughs> yeah they took away unemployment and they replaced it with the lottery <laughs> yeah i know Ohio is a great state that functions very well. <laughs> Michigan too. <laughs> you guys have a lottery? They take away the unemployment for everybody. Well, I yeah, I was on it, and then they're like, "Okay, you need to start searching for a job again if you're gonna." They had waived that, and I was like, "Well, I'm gonna be like probably moving, so I don't know if I should get a job now." So, I'm kind of in a spot where I don't have really an income, so that's nice. Yeah, that's a bummer, and a lot of people are in the same boat for lots of different reasons because. Mm-hmm. You know, life is not a one size fits all situation. And it was actually like a super helpful thing. Yeah. It probably rented a lot. I mean, a lot of bad has happened the last year and a half, but it probably rented. And again, of course, not that everybody who got, who needed it, got it, but like at least helped. And yeah. now they're trying to kneecap that and make everybody go back to like shit restaurant jobs. Mm-hmm. With like no social distancing while there's a variant and whatever. I don't know. Yeah. Everything's great. Nothing's wrong. <laughs> We'll probably be up in like I think we're gonna try and play Marquette. Oh really? Spring. So in the spring? We played Bay City before. I think that's about you. We'll probably do that again. Yeah, like um, we're we're living like outside um Traverse City right now and okay. and we're moving even further up, hopefully. So yeah, if we're in if we're in Calumet, we'll definitely come and see you in Marquette. That's you know a couple hours still, but Michigan's a big state. And we have driven it all basically and I don't mind driving at all. To see good things. We do talk about doing like a Michigan only tour at some point because there's so many places you can play. Yeah. Just like an absolutely absurd, like, you know, every, every town. Yeah. Like, like if you really dug in, you could do like two weeks in just Michigan. Ah, oh, man. I, I'm going to do hey. that someday too. I'm going to do that. Hold on one second. Hey, actually, I got to go because my neighbor's talking to me. Okay. Um, good place to stop, I guess. Dude, good talking to you. Let's. They don't make them so long, okay? Okay, yeah, yeah, let's do it again. Thank you. Later. Later. Yeah, see ya.